So from the standpoint of food, we use food not from the standpoint of just removing uh, nutritionally deficient food or nutritionally toxic food, but we use nutrition from a, in a manipulative standpoint. So for instance, when I say a defined plant-based diet, we often put the patients on a raw plant-based diet. We often put them on time-restricted eating. Sometimes I may put them on just cold-pressed juices or cold-pressed uh, uh, or raw smoothies, uh, depending on their clinical condition. If someone with inflammatory bowel disease, many of them cannot properly digest uh, a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, and so, you know, they may not be pulling in the adequate nutrients. Also, it does reduce the inflammatory process rapidly enough. So th there's certain situation where someone's eating a whole food plant-based diet and they may still suffer an acute event. It just depends on exactly how they're applying that whole food plant-based diet. That's one. Two, it depends on the platform in which they're, they're starting from. So let me ask that question a little differently. If someone's eating a perfect whole food plant-based diet, they're, sleep, <laughs> they're sleeping, they're exercising, their stress is moderate, they have a no salt, no sugar, no oil diet. They're eating, you know, really a high lot of raw vegetables with it. Do sometimes people like that still have a heart attack or stroke? You know, I think the chances are minimal. I mean, for instance, you know, you, you, you get into biological statistical events and maybe, um, maybe something else in their life happens that can trigger that biological event. Uh, something outside of the food. Uh, maybe they get uh, in touch with some type of a chemical substance. Maybe they take a medication. Maybe they take a, you know, you know, some type of a, you know, immunization, whatever. And they may have an adverse effect to that substance that they put in their body. Because remember, a perfect whole food plant based diet doesn't mean that they're not putting other things in their system. Um, and what about? saturated fat from plant-based sources. Is that a problem? You know, if the plant sources are not cooked, uh, I don't think it's a problem. I mean, for instance, coconut meat in the whole food form has some form of saturated fat. Now, people say, well, you increase cholesterol, LDL cholesterol with that. Um, that may be true, but that molecule, that saturated fat molecule in the coconut is biochemically different than the saturated molecule that come from uh, animal product. So if it's a whole food and it's not processed in its natural state, then I think that form of fat, quote unquote, is going to be okay for you. For people who are trying to avoid disease, especially heart disease and stroke, what do we need to know about these four things, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and triglycerides. What do we need to know? You know, one thing uh, regarding triglycerides, I'll, I'll start there. I, I like to look at triglyceride to HDL ratio. If you have a high triglyceride to HDL ratio, that's a, uh, uh, an underlying signal that you may have insulin resistance. If you have insulin resistance, then uh, insulin behaves like a growth hormone and it can potentiate smooth muscle uh, proliferation and, and, and vascular cell walls and, and potentiate vascular disease uh, a somewhere and therefore anywhere. That's one. Two, LDL cholesterol it predisposes to atherogenesis. Generally speaking, um, I like to think of it in terms of the particle size, the LDL cholesterol molecules are carried in. So you have you know, high LDL cholesterol and a high number of, of, of small particles, then I tend to worry about that because that tends to be more atherogenic. Uh, and of course, total cholesterol, um, you know, again, underscores all of that. But, but more so if you have an abnormal, uh, quote unquote, abnormal cholesterol panel, i.e. too high cholesterol, I tend to think of that as an underlying metabolic disorder. And so an underlying metabolic disorder, I first of all think of the liver, but the other, you know, smooth uh, skeletal muscle, metabolism, et cetera. But you have an underlying medical uh, metabolic disorder, which potentiates an underlying 
biochemical imbalance. So I tend to step back and look at that uh, lipid profile, not just say, oh, well, high LDL atherosclerosis and high triglyceride ratio, ratio is resistance and da da da. That's true. But I think when we step back and look at that abnormal, quote unquote, abnormal lipid uh, metabolism, we need to say, okay, this is underlying abnormal metabolism in general, i.e., there's hepatic dysfunction and other cells and organ dysfunction too. And having said that, then the whole biochemical milieu is off balance. And so that's when you're looking at potential, you know, acute events, because we have biochemical imbalance predisposed to a lot of things. It predisposed mitochondrial dysfunction, which predisposed to, you know, inflammation. And these things are happening at the cellular level. And so we don't, we're not able to directly measure all of these things. So that's why I look at these global smoke signals, i.e. abnormal lipid profile, and say that's where there's smoke, there's fire. So someone's lipid profile may be off, but then there's fire inside the cell. And that's where the problem is. And we don't always understand exactly what's happening at the cellular level when we see these numbers. If someone says to you, um, I, I understand you recommend a whole food plant-based diet, but there's absolutely no way I'm going to do that. But I'd like to know what's the best animal products to eat for my heart or what's the least worst. So is there an order between beef, chicken, fish, dairy, eggs, turkey, veal? Is there some hierarchy of what you would, if someone's going to absolutely insist on eating it, what would be the, the best of those? Gosh, that now that's a very difficult question. I mean, you know, <laughs> I guess the order I give, depending on my motivation, you know, I guess which which order would I recommend be depending on whether I want them to feed my practice over the long run or not. But I mean, to take your question more seriously, you know, some people argue that you want to consume animals that are uh, biologically further away from, you know, your, the human being, right? So you're going to eat something that's not a mammal. So, okay, you're not going to eat a monkey or whatever. But fish, perhaps in that list you gave, is probably, you know, the furthest away from, you know, human beings. You know, you're not, it's further from the cow, you know, cow, you know, you, you, maybe the cow's less on that list, maybe fish. It, that's what some people argue. Maybe you can make that teleological argument. Uh, however, uh, it's I think those those foods are so bunched together, it's hard to say. But I guess I would put fish and and maybe sardines in particular uh, there. I wouldn't make any of the uh, crab or shellfish in that list. So I'd probably just specialize sardines. And then the other fish, I'd say, try to avoid it. I don't know. Next on that list, um, you may say fowl before pigs and cows, because pigs and cows are closer to humans. But this is just a guess. And so sardines, uh, wild, wild fowl, and and no domesticated animals. So you. You would want to try to get the wild animals that you can. So sardines, wild fowl, and then domesticated pigs and cows would be last on the list. It's the best. That's the best I can do. That's a that's a tough, you know, one to. to yeah, I've, I've asked, been asked that question before. I think you've been the person to ask that. <laughs> what is your thought as a cardiologist about? raw seeds, nuts, avocados, olives, and then separately of uh, good quality oils like hemp, flax, olive, chia, walnut. So first, raw, organic, vegan, but fats, seeds, nuts, avocados, and olives. And then a separate question, high quality oils. What are your thoughts? So, on so I'm good with the seeds and nuts uh, and avocados, and they should be raw. I'm glad you emphasize that they're raw. You know, the, the, the one issue with the seeds and nuts is that, you know, we can go to the supermarket and, you know, those things are just in large containers and you can just 
Yeah, you can fill up a bag of the nuts and you go shopping. By the time you get to the cash register, they're half price, you know? And so the thing is that it's the, the nuts in their natural state. So if I were to say, add to that raw seeds, nuts, and, and avocados in their natural state, meaning that the consumer, you got to crack each shell, or pick it out or whatever, that's even better. Uh, because it 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 reduces the amount that you can just sort of eat very easily. Um, uh, so clearly, those in a natural state are fine. But even if they're not in the shells, if you 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 know don't overdo it, uh, then I think you're fine. From the standpoint of oils, I think we should limit the oils. I mean, the only oils we um, you know, have our patients consume or in the form of like a vitamin D supplement, or there may be other supplements that may have an oil uh, uh, with it in order to help absorption of a, a targeted supplement. But we don't recommend the use of any oils on a regular basis, even in the raw state, even on the salad dressing. I mean, if if on a rare occasion you have something out that has oil in it, that's one thing. But we just recommend we recommend total absence of oil, and especially if it's someone's in a detox uh, situation. So the, the detox situation, and I like to emphasize that when when I'm talking about food with certain patients, when I'm talking to someone who's acutely ill, and we have them on a on an aggressive detox, that's akin to having them in the medical ICU. So the medical ICU. Your behavior with that patient is much different than on the step-down telemetry ward, much different than on the regular uh, ward. So there's going to be a level of stringency in the ICU for the patient in a much more critical condition than it is of a patient in a regular medical ward. So if someone's in a detox regimen, a heart failure patient comes in, their volume overload, has to give them diuretics. You know, they're, they're acutely ill, they're inflamed, they may have uh, lupus, they may have also renal insufficiency. So they, they have these chronic inflammatory conditions and they're teetering on the verge of having to be hospitalized. That person on a raw detox diet, not a bite, not a drop, not a crumb of anything outside of what we recommend. And so there are no exceptions with the manipulation of the diet. So I, I, I gave you that piece of detail to, to answer that question more fully because when I say, okay, no oil, uh, with the exception of maybe on a rare occasion, you know, X, Y, and Z, da, 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 da. That's in one situation. But in another situation, I may say absolutely no oil. <laughs>